first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers of the conference and Deepa for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, Nida, it's nice to virtually meet you. And um, my background is a background in corporate finance, actually. So I'm going to have a very different perspective on all of the papers in this conference, I think, from uh, the rest of the presenters and discussants. And then my interest in energy comes from my prior work uh, as an energy trader. And I'm very interested in more physical aspects of the energy market, more dealing with inventories, pipelines, and the actual flow of things in the energy markets. Uh, so uh, let me first summarize the paper. Uh, the paper is looking to predict a variety of crude oil related variables, including uh, future returns, spot returns, uh, inventories and production, as well as uh, some of the returns on large companies in the energy space. Uh, they're using standard measures uh, used to forecast uh, crude oil returns. However, their innovation is that they include the energy news based measures. So they uh, include this uh, uh, kind of amazing uh, technique of going through uh, over 2 million articles. Uh, selecting the energy topics, finding these energy topics based on keywords, uh, looking at their frequency, looking at their sentiment, looking at how unusual some of the articles are in terms of how words are matched up. And they're trying to see whether this helps us predict any of these variables, the multiple variables in the crude oil space. This has been shown to work with equity returns, so these news measures do predict equity returns in about a sample of 51 countries, as a prior paper has shown. So now the interest here has been, what, what does it do for crude oil? They find in-sample predictability, and especially for their news variables, but then there's no out-of-sample predictability. What do I like about this paper? I think that looking at news, especially now, is especially interesting there's a variety of topics with the, you know, with the fake news explosion and other news. There's so many angles. There's such a large scope of possibilities in this topic in general. And I didn't know as much about it before I started reading the paper. And um, I really like applying this news methodology to looking at crude oil specifically. I think crude oil is a very difficult market. Uh, if you follow kind of the ups and down across all the markets, um, I've just been watching things more closely. Crude oil, natural gas, and interestingly also lean hogs are always the top uh, or bottom price increases or drops out of a variety of commodity and non-commodity prices globally. So uh, a very tough market to, to look at, but a very important market. I am uh, very happy to see how honest the authors are about their out-of-sample results, how they walk the readers through their process of discovering out-of-sample results and how the matches can be found. But they honestly say, you know, right now we can't see a way to do it systematically uh, outside of data mining. Uh, but to me as a corporate person looking at this, there's so many variables. There's uh, so many predicting variables. It feels like so much is going into the model. So a lot of my comments will deal with kind of narrowing the scope down. And again, keep in mind, I think the paper is great as is, and it has its own direction. As a, as a discussant, I wanted to bring some uh, extra possibilities for the authors to consider, and uh, I'm bringing to the table what it is that I know about. So I'm going to try to narrow the scope on the news, probably, and expand it in some of these physical areas that I'm interested in. So um, some possible uh, extensions that I can see for this paper, because as I, as I said, I think that currently in its current state, it's more or less of a product, as I think the authors want to see it, is uh, I'm very interested in inventory myself, so <laughs> selfishly, I'm going to recommend an extension of the inventory analysis, and in, I'm going to walk uh, uh, you through uh, this in more detail in the next couple of slides. So I'm going to come back to this topic. I'm also going to come back to a discussion of possibly looking at the volatility risk premium in all markets, uh, just because the authors are getting so much uh, kind of positive out of sample returns, positive out of sample results there. So I would like to also point out that this is an interesting variable and a possible extension. So both one and two, I'm going to come back and show some slides about, but 
this energy new segment I'm going to discuss right now. So um, I wanted the authors to perhaps, if they've done so much already, but I wanted them to perhaps go even further to expand the energy dictionary and vocabulary and update the sentiment measures because the energy space is so different from like this common log run uh, dictionaries that's out there. Uh, and uh, the reactions are different between the common uh, words that are considered to be of good sentiment and then what it brings to oil and oil prices, returns, and so on. Uh, so, for example, when we have economic growth versus a, a war and we look at equity markets, they'll go up for economic growth, they'll go down when there's a war. If you look at the crude uh, market, it's, the prices are going to increase both for economic growth and wars, especially if these wars are somewhere in the Middle East in the large producing nations. So I think it requires more careful consideration in terms of sentiment specific to crude oil news and expanding the dictionary vocabulary and sentiment specification. Another example we just had at the beginning of this year, this big uh, um, MBS, uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Putin temper tantrum, kind of a power struggle where Saudi Arabia released a, a large production, a supply shock, they dropped a lot of oil into the market, they caused a drop in crude prices. This has nothing to do with economic activity, but really had kind of this world leader tantrum address. What, what kind of sentiment is this? This is really specific to the oil uh, market as well. So I think there's a lot that can be done just in this space specific to energy news as well. Uh, so, kind of following up on that, uh, I know that you're looking at seven topics and you're broadly sweeping everything, but given the importance of the Middle East and the OPEC nations, I think it could be interesting to look at new specific to OPEC nations and how it's influencing the crude oil uh, variables, especially the returns, the future, and the spot prices. And uh, another, this more recent uh, variables that would be of interest, especially in your sample time frame 98 through 2000, is looking at this alternative or renewable energy and the rise of uh, renewable and alternative energy. Uh, currently, is this variable somewhat captured in some of your subgroups, but maybe making it more specific could, could be interesting. Uh, so another possible expansion, which I thought would be I need, and I'm thinking about the US market, is you know, in the US market, we have so many different crude areas uh, that are very specific and have very specific characteristics. For example, we have the Eagle Ford in Texas, the Permian Basin, the Colorado uh, mining area, the Bakken and Marcellus and Utica shales. All of these areas also have spot prices uh, that are specific to them. Uh, like Midland, for example, is around Eagle Ford and Permian. And there's a difference between the local spot prices for Midland and the WTI price. So I was wondering whether you can localize your research and look at more local news that are specific to the Eagle Ford or to the Permian Basin and see whether that can explain the basis between the Midland and the WTI price. So more, more localized news do they explain this more localized basis? And expanding on that like idea of basis, as I was thinking, well, why don't we then even go bigger since you have this global news? Why don't we look at the biggest basis or spread, which is the brand WTI spread? You don't have this variable in uh, your dependent predict, you, you're not trying to forecast it, but perhaps the news do contribute to uh, explaining this difficult to understand spread and how it's varied the brand WTI prices. Perhaps some news specifically related to pipeline capacity, maybe that's some category of news that's specific to energy that could be used here um, that can be uh, interesting. And then this five, I, I highlighted it, and, and this is more of my interest and as, as how I think of things, given that I'm a corporate person, my, my first uh, idea is to go to uh, like firms and firm specific information. And I think that the uh, firms in the energy space and how they present information also provide a lot of uh, news. Okay. Sorry, we have uh, five minutes. Okay, thank you. In, 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 their, in their 10K or 10Q reports. So perhaps, you know, and, and I am very interested in this myself, you can look at the 10Qs and Ks 
of these companies in the whole uh, EMP space or the crude oil space in the US or globally, and as well as CEO press releases and draw with your word analysis of those to better understand changes in crude oil uh, markets as well. So these are kind of like the energy news suggestions and what can be done. And I think there's a large scope of what can be done here. Uh, I'm going to now talk about the inventory analysis and then very briefly about the volatility risk premium. And then I have some very minor comments that I'm not going to get to, but I'll let the authors uh, take a look at them. So I'm going to look specifically out of all of your forecasting variables, out of all the seven forecasting variables, specifically at the oil uh, changes in oil inventories, because I know something about this uh, physical space. First of all, I want to highlight there's a variety of oil inventories. So I would suggest that you don't only look at the overall oil inventories that include the strategic petroleum reserve, but break them out because these inventories are all very different beasts, so to say. So the strategic petroleum reserve and changes in the strategic petroleum reserve don't follow the same um, news articles or even explanatory variables as the other crude oil inventories across the US. So there's these five petroleum area defense districts, and then there's oil inventories in Cushing, Oklahoma, which is the NIMAC settlement point for the WTI uh, contract. So his operational variables largely explain inventories in these uh, districts, but Cushing, Oklahoma, for example, their inventories are not well predicted by operational variables, and they very largely with spread. And, and I have a paper actually looking specifically at that. So I think like looking at more specific oil inventories and changes in those oil inventories could bring a more, uh, in terms of expanding this inventory analysis. Uh, you can get higher frequency data from this company called Genscape. They have daily inventory data. And I think for inventories, you need to also include things like refinery draws and net import exports, which are available from the EIA. So here are some of your in-sample regressions. I wanted to look at them and just ask a couple of questions. I know your uh, variables of not only inventory, but all are detrended, and that's uh, needed because there's been a large increase in inventory capacity in the US from 98 to 2000. But do you include any seasonal adjustments? So inventory production and other crude oil variables are very seasonal. So I think it's important to include seasonal adjustment in your uh, models as well. So why is the next question is just like, why is there a negative coefficient on the production variables? This suggests that if I increase production today, eight weeks from now, I'm going to have lower inventories. So they didn't quite make sense to me. And I wanted to ask that question. And uh, furthermore, I wanted to ask more, does this make sense in terms of the relationship between changes in inventory and some of these news measures? So these news measures suggest that inventories will be lower if there is a higher number of articles, energy articles. Uh, if there's a higher frequency of refining and petroleum, uh, petrochemical articles. Also, if there's more unusual articles, there'll be lower future uh, inventories. And if there's more positive sentiment for exploration and production news today, we'll have less inventories eight weeks down the road. So just wanted to get more of an explanation in the text in terms of how should we understand this? Does it make sense for inventories? Uh, so uh, very briefly, uh, these, these are stability models, and this is not what uh, Nida showed us. This is a different table. And uh, here we see all of the variables that they're examining. The darker colors on this graph suggest that the model stability is higher, and I'm going to look at my inventory variables I'm discussing and also this oil volatility. Here we see more of the tax-based measures, and here we see more of the traditional measures. So we can see that like oil volatility uh, stability is pretty good, even with some of the tax-based measures, but even more so with the traditional measures. And in general, I'm so looking at this that sentiment is provides a lot of stability in their tests compared to some of these other text-based measures. Uh, however, that's not quite true for sentiment for the inventories. Sentiment doesn't provide much of a um, stability for models with the changes in inventory, but the overall sentiment does, not energy-specific sentiment. However, there are still some tax-based measures that uh, have decent explanatory power 
for inventories and not only for inventories. So I wanted to bring this up saying that I think that sentiment is a very stable measure, uh, uh, but you know, there's variation on this. And seeing this was, um, was it convinced me that indeed, like sentiment is something that I want to look at and also some specific sentiments or topics. Uh, so that's it for inventories. I would just like for you guys to expand this topic more, but that's because that's my personal interest. I like inventories and the physical aspect of it. And the next one, I'm going to talk about the variance risk premium or specifically not the variance, the volatility risk premium because of the definition. The volatility risk premium here is defined as the difference between implied and realized volatilities. The implied volatility is on the um, ETF uh, that uh, holds the WTI futures, there is an implied volatility on it, and uh, then we subtract the realized volatility of crude oil prices from that. And this is um, the number of fixed models that beat the constant models. This is the same heat map that NIDA has shown us. And I just wanted to highlight, as you look across the darkest kind of row is for this volatility risk premium, and here you can see it's pretty dark. Oh, it's the same variable. So, and and, and actually, when we look at these text-based measures, they... Uh, Katarina, uh, sorry, we should be wrapping up to let uh, later Nita react. Please. Yes, uh, provide a lot of explanatory variables. So perhaps it's interesting to just explore this variable, the volatility risk premium, especially in crude oil markets, is interesting in itself, and it's interesting to see how the text-based measures come in here. I have a lot of uh, other suggestions. These are all small and uh, very difficult to implement. So I'll let the authors take a look at uh, this whenever they want to. And uh, I would like to thank everybody again for allowing me to discuss this paper. I think that it's very interesting. I like this news approach to crude oil um, uh, market, especially to inventories and the physical side of it. So good luck and I look forward to uh, reading the next version of the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bernie. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for this nice uh, discussion and it's nice to meet you virtually as well. Uh, so yes, I mean, uh, Totally agree. These are all, you know, like good points and these are the things we also kind of considered because we have been, as I said before, working on this project for a few years, uh, for a few years now. Uh, but I mean, it is at least for this, you know, particular, uh, you know, like version of the paper, we just really wanted to come up with, you know, like a set of a broad set of comprehensive, you know, like mapping of news measures and uh, see, you know, like whether, you know, uh, you know, like they are useful in predicting oil markets. Uh, outcomes. So that's why we actually, in the discussion, we didn't really focus on, you know, one particular variable or one, you know, like particular measure, because as it is right now, the, the paper is already uh, really, really long, but I totally agree. I mean, as you already said, you know, like even, you know, shown by the, you know, our word clouds as well, right? For instance, we have, of course, like uh, OPEC or like renewable energy environment, all sorts of you know, like uh, things in our word class, and we have uh, measures uh, for these topics, uh, the, which can, I believe, uh, Harry, I guess, would know the answer to that better, but um, this can, I think, be the, be probably done like more specific to focus on, uh, as you said, uh, more specific questions. Let it be, I guess, you know, like the inventories or, you know, like localized, you know, like prices or the or the price uh, separate. I totally agree. I mean, these are all great and nice suggestions. And I think there's a lot of scope in terms of analyzing. And I guess, but just even like by themselves, you know, like uh, these will be, I guess, like separate papers by, you know, like itself. Many of them will be, I guess, uh, uh, several, uh, several papers. And in terms of your specific questions, uh, to be honest, I will try to get back to you. We didn't really, as I said, focus on like interpretation of these, you know, like variables. We tried to do that in the very, you know, beginning of the of the project. So I have to really go back and think about, you know, like the sign and how to interpret these uh, these uh, these variables. Um, and um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, Mike Planta, for instance, have a paper on OPEC news that I also, you know, mentioned in the uh, in the paper where he looks at, for instance, the uh, you know how changes in the OPEC news affect oil uh, volatility. Uh, for example, it is also another very interesting uh, interesting uh, aspect. And yes, we we were surprised with, for instance, the uh, you know uh, the. Uh, the performance of these, uh, you know, uh, risk premium measures uh, in, you know, like a successful out of uh, out of sample because these measures are uh, kind of the mostly frequently appearing and uh, yes, especially, you know, like for a future run, uh, I guess these set of variables will be the ones that we will be examining to see whether they continue to, for instance, outperform. Uh, art perform going forward. Uh, so, uh, yeah, all all great uh, suggestions, uh, Kate, and I'll be in touch. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nida.